Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining us today in our cardiovascular grand rounds. Welcome, Dr. Nilan, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Lorena Telles. I work at La Cardio, and it's my pleasure to introduce to you our moderators for this event. Dr. Julian Helves, cardiologist and echocardiographer, and Dr. Claudia Patricia Jaimes, cardiologist and imaging specialist at La Carte. Welcome and thank you for moderating this event. Muy buenas tardes a todos. Muchas gracias por acompañarnos en nuestro Grand Rounds en Medicina Cardiovascular. Mi nombre es Julian Helves y estaré acompañado en esta moderación de esta conferencia con la doctora Claudia Patricia Jaimes. Le recordamos que al conectarse a esta conferencia, autorizan el tratamiento de sus datos personales, los cuales serán tratados de acuerdo con la Ley 1581 de 2012 y nuestra política de datos personales, la cual pueden consultar en www.cardioinfantil.org. De igual forma, le informamos que esta conferencia está siendo grabada. El chat de preguntas siempre va a estar habilitado en la barra de participantes, les agradecemos que puedan ir progresivamente dejando allí sus inquietudes, las cuales resolveremos al final de la sesión. Buenas tardes a todos. Hoy tenemos el honor de contar con un invitado muy especial, el doctor Thomas Nilan, con su conferencia Advanced Cardiac Imaging Among Patients with Cardiovascular Complications from Cancer Immunotherapy. El doctor Nilan es director del programa de cardioncología del Massachusetts General Hospital en Boston. Es codirector del programa de cardioresonancia PET y CT del mismo hospital y es profesor asociado de medicina de la Universidad de Harvard. El doctor Nilan ha sido autor y coautor de más de 150 manuscritos originales, 40 artículos de revisión y ha sido conferencista de un gran número de congresos nacionales e internacionales. Good afternoon, Dr. Nilan, and welcome to La Cardio. It's really a pleasure to have you in our Brown Rounds today. Please go ahead with your presentation. Thank you very much, Dr. Jaimes, Dr. Helves, and uh, Dr. Medina for the very kind invitation to speak. Uh, I'm Tom Nealon, I'm a cardiologist, and I work at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. And I'm going to talk about cardiovascular disease in cancer patients with a real focus on the value of imaging in cardiovascular disease with, uh, among cancer patients. And for this talk, I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to mostly focus on immune therapy for cancer. There's a reason why I'm going to talk about immune therapy for cancer, and I have some slides on that later. But in brief, this is the future of cancer care. Maybe it's not so much the present for many communities, but it is indeed the future. There are over 5,000 clinical trials testing the value of immune therapy in patients with cancer. And so, over the next coming years, we are going to be talking about more commonly about the use of checkpoint inhibitors, in particular in patients who are getting chemotherapy and radiation therapy. So the image on the left, the wheel on the left, shows the multiple different ways that we can leverage the immune system to treat cancer. As, as you know, you can leverage the immune system using adopt cell transfer therapies, which include CAR T. You can do it using vaccines. You can do it using cytokines. But for most of this talk, I am going to focus on checkpoint inhibitors. Immune checkpoint inhibitors represent a paradigm shift in the care of patients with cancer. They are cancer's newest miracle cure. Ex-president Jimmy Carter of the United States on the bottom left was diagnosed with widely metastatic malignant melanoma. This was in 2015. He had metastatic disease throughout his brain, liver, spinal cords, every organ system. He got a couple of doses of one of these immune checkpoint inhibitor, a drug called pembrolizumab, and he is still well, 2022, and, uh, and is cancer-free, which is pretty remarkable. Metastatic, metastatic melanoma and, uh, the, um, and still cancer-free many years later. So how do these therapies work? I am not an oncologist. I'm a cardiologist. So this may seem simple to some of you. But the T cells will recognize can cancer cells uh, the, and will attack them 
That's what normally happens. Sometimes the T cells do not recognize the cancer cells as bad because these cancer cells carry proteins that act as a mask. For example, one of these masks is PD PDL1. So the PDL1, uh, PD1 on the T cells binds to PDL1, which is on the cancer cells, and thinks, oh, this is a healthy cell, I'm going to leave it alone. The immune checkpoint inhibitors are drugs, antibodies that block PD1 and PDL1, and they take away those masks or blinders and allow the cancer uh, the T cells to do their thing to attack and kill cancer cells. When the FDA approved these immune checkpoint inhibitors for the treatment of cancer, they approved them with the understanding that you can't leverage the power of the immune system without anticipating immune-related adverse cardiac events. So they said, if you use these drugs, you're probably going to get side effects, and these side effects are going to be driven by the immune system attacking or various organs in the body, every organ system in the body. And they were right. Most patients get an immune-related adverse event, get some form of toxicity when they start these immune checkpoint inhibitors. However, the vast, vast majority of these toxicities are mild and e easily manageable. But they're common. Up to 90% of patients will get some toxicity. Very severe toxicities, which require the drug to be stopped, occur in anywhere from about 6 to 35%. So I see a lot of patients, and I'm going to talk about cardiovascular disease in these patients who get immune therapy. And often the questions I ask or the questions come from where seeing a patient and trying to understand what happened to them. So this is a consult. I saw a 49-year-old man with metastatic renal cell cancer. He was started on one of these checkpoint inhibitors called nivolumab in 2018. He was out with his friends, having a good time, didn't feel great the following day. His partner said, you've got to go to the emergency room. And he said, I'm fine. But eventually he gave in and went to the emergency room. In the emergency room, they did an EKG, which is shown here. And you can see that there's ST and T wave changes, mostly here on the chest leads. The patient did not have a prior EKG for comparison. So the emergency room drew high sensitivity troponins, which are shown at the bottom here, and the values were 15, 14, and 18. So detectable, but not markedly high. Because of the abnormal EKG and the potential for cardiovascular symptoms, the patient had a stress test. And they did both an exercise stress test and did a nuclear stress test. And on that exercise test, the patient went 10 mets, which is pretty good exercise capacity. They did nuclear imaging and the nuclear imaging did not show any ischemia and these donuts here on the right hand side. And they said normal images, ejection fraction 72%. So he was discharged. Two days later, he had a regular oncology appointment because he was getting this immune checkpoint inhibitor. He tells his story and they repeat EKG, which is shown here on the left of the screen. Is it and you can see on the EKG, the patient has persistent STT wave changes, uh, the um, unchanged from two days prior. So they called and they said, we have this patient, what do you think? And these are often phone calls like happens when you work and going where there's a concern and they want a quick answer. And so I said, I'm not sure, let's do an echocardiogram. And so we did an echocardiogram, and the echocardiogram said the left ventricular cavity size is normal. Systolic function is normal, is 58%. And I'm not going to show all the images from the echocardiogram. This is just a parasternal lung. And so they called back and said, we did your echocardiogram. Things look fine. Can we continue to give him this cancer therapy? And I said, I'm not sure. So I asked him to do a cardiac MRI. And the cardiac MRI, I'm not going to show all the images in the interest of time, but on the left are the black blood imaging for edema, and on the right are the late gadolinium enhancement images for fibrosis. And the patient did not have edema, did not have fibrosis. So those are the two hallmark things we look for when we're trying to diagnose myocarditis. But they said that the ejection fraction is about 58%. And if you remember, 
I know this is not apples to apples, but his ejection fraction started out as being on the nuclear test at over 70%, and now is 55% on MRI. And he had this abnormal EKG. So I couldn't explain those two things. And so I said, I think we need to do a biopsy. So he had a native heart biopsy guided by an echocardiogram. And these are the pathological images from his native heart biopsy. And I'm not a pathologist, so, but the images show this marked T cell infiltration into the myocardium consistent with myocarditis. So this patient had myocarditis from this immune checkpoint inhibitor. He started corticosteroids as an immunosuppressant, a methylprednisone, high dose, one gram per day, 1,000 milligrams. And after three days, transition to oral prednisone, and they repeated the EKG a couple of weeks later. And you can see that the EKG changes have normalized. We also repeated his echocardiogram, and his ejection fraction had climbed back into the 60s. So that case was a little tough to make the diagnosis of myocarditis uh, the, um, related to immune checkpoint inhibitors. But some cases aren't that tough. So this is a 69 year old male that I helped take care of, who again with renal cell carcinoma, got one of these checkpoint inhibitors in combination with a, tar uh, a targeted therapy and presented with fatigue and shortness of breath. At the time he presented, we were doing conventional troponins and this 1.25, which is elevated. And he had the EKG shown on the bottom right. And the EKG was abnormal. So a little bit fast, diffuse, diffuse STT wave changes on the EKG. He had the cardiac MRI, and these are the CINE images from the cardiac MRI. And you can see that their left ventricular systolic function was markedly reduced. This patient did have late gadolinium enhancement on his cardiac MRI. No areas of edema that we could tell, but uh, we didn't do T2 mapping. Uh, this was back 2016. And so the patient went emergently for an endomyocardial biopsy, a native heart biopsy, and the biopsy showed a myocarditis as shown on the image here on the right. Left is normal, right is this patient with myocarditis. Actually, it looked for all the world like transplant rejection, but the patient didn't have a transplant. This patient got really sick and was treated with uh, immuno, a heavy dose of immunosuppression. So they got corticosteroids and they continued to decline. So on top of corticosteroids, they got a drug called ATG or antithymocyte globulin which is commonly reserved for patients with advanced transplant rejection. And you can see the follow-up echocardiogram done 20, years, 20 days later, so apologies, showed improvement in left ventricular systolic function. So this patient was in, in bad shape from myocarditis, got um, myocarditis due to immune checkpoint inhibitor, got heavy dose immunosuppression, had imaging to confirm the diagnosis, got heavy doses of immunosuppression, and then recovered. One of the questions I often get asked is what's the incidence of this immune checkpoint inhibitor myocarditis? And I would say it's not common, right? It is far less than 5% of patients who get this. My best estimate is about 1% of patients. So one in every 100 patients who gets an immune checkpoint inhibitor will get myocarditis. And you might appropriately say, well, that's not a lot of patients, Tom. And my reply will be, well, two things. One is that the use of immune checkpoint inhibitors is going to increase dramatically. So there are going to be a lot of patients who get it. And then number two is for that 1% of patients who get myocarditis, the outcomes are really are bad. And what do I mean by that is the case fatality rate alone with myocarditis from an immune checkpoint inhibitor is, is between 20 and 30% conservatively. And then there's lots of morbidity like cardiogenic shock, VT, complete heart block. And curiously also, almost 40% of events occur in patients with a normal ejection fraction. What's shown in this image here on the bottom right is that there are other types of toxicities occur with this therapy, including colitis, pneumonitis, and hepatitis, which are more common. And here's myocarditis way down here, which is less common, but the fatality rate shown on the right here in the darker color is far higher than with colitis, pneumonitis, or hepatitis. So how do you approach the diagnosis of these patients? So the first thing we do is after we take a history and do a physical examination is that we, we, measure, we perform an EKG and measure some biomarkers. And on the biomarkers, we always ask for troponin and anti-pro-BMP. 
and over 90 something percent of patients will have a detectable troponin. So it's a great test. Two thirds will have an elevated anti-pro BMP. On the EKG, what we look for is the QRS duration. So the QRS duration tends to increase in patients with myocarditis. The next thing we ask for is we ask for a measurement of the left ventricular ejection fraction. And, at the, um, and typically we ask for an echocardiogram. However, the echo, and we can ask for an echocardiogram either on, or, and we ask for an ejection fraction measure, either an echocardiogram or an MRI. MRI shown here on the right, echocardiogram in the middle. However, the ejection fraction is normal in about 55% of cases. So having a normal ejection fraction, the patient could still have myocarditis and importantly, could still do badly from that myocarditis. So we've known in the cardio-oncology world that the use of, of a measurement of ejection fraction for detection of cardiotoxicity has limitations because the ejection fraction can be normal and the patient can still have cardiac toxicity. And so we've, lots of studies have looked at the measurement of global longitudinal strain in patients with checkpoint inhibitor myocarditis. And so we asked the same question here what happens to global longitudinal strain? So you can measure this on your echocardiogram. And what we found with several things was that global longitudinal strain or GLS is the same in patients in cases and controls prior to starting immune therapy. So in patients who develop, who before they start immune therapy, the GLS is the same in patients who, have, who go on to develop myocarditis as, though, as compared to those who do not. So baseline values are similar between both. But with the development of myocarditis, the GLS or global longitudinal strain decreases. And whereas among patients who don't develop myocarditis, we don't see a marked change in GLS. So there's a reduction in global longitudinal strain with myocarditis. So we'll always ask our echocardiography colleagues to measure, to measure global longitudinal strain in these patients. There's not a lot of value in these patients to saying, oh, the ejection fraction, I don't think there's a lot of value in these patients to say the ejection fraction is 20% markedly reduced. And we also measure global longitudinal strain because you already know the heart is in trouble. But in the patients with preserved ejection fraction, there's real additive value because GLS is also reduced in patients with preserved ejection fraction and myocarditis. So we will often go to our colleagues and say, you know, in the preserved EF patient population where there's a concern, can you measure GLS? And the reduction in GLS in both, in all patients and in patients with both preserved and reduced ejection fraction is prognostic. And so the, the, the having a lower GLS associates with worse outcomes. You can also measure global longitudinal strain on more than just echocardiography and you can measure it on cardiac MRI. This is a very brief anecdote, but these are the cardiac MRI images shown here on the left of a patient, a normal patient at the top and a patient with immune checkpoint inhibitor myocarditis on the bottom. And so this patient had a normal ejection fraction and the patient on the bottom who had ICI myocarditis actually had sudden death. And so I was thinking, should I have done something differently with this patient? And I went back and I retrospectively measured their global longitudinal strain and the normal patient is on the top. My patient who died is on the bottom and you can see that their global longitudinal strain is reduced at minus 40. And so this patient had lower, lower global longitudinal strain. So if I had it all back, maybe if I'd measured this, I would have realized that this patient's heart was in trouble. This area got a little more complicated recently when there was a beautiful mouse study where they actually gave mice immune checkpoint inhibitors and said that there's in normal mice, there's an immune cell infiltration, which can actually reduce my, uh, GLS in the absence of myocarditis. So maybe there's a small cohort of patients who, in whom the GLS is reduced in the setting of checkpoints who don't have myocarditis. So what about MRI? It's a standard test when you're worried about myocarditis. If possible, it should be done on everybody. And when you do the test, you can see all these pretty pictures shown here on the left-hand side. This is transmural late gadolinium enhancement, the white area here in the myocardium. 
This is mid myocardial late gathering enhancement. This is diffuse shown down here in the bottom left. This is lots of different patterns shown on the, on the uh, bottom right here. And here is normal. And so you can see all these different patterns of late gathering enhancement on your MRI. But when you look at, at the aggregate of patients, what do you see? And when you aggregate patients, what you actually see is that in those who present with a normal ejection fraction, shown down here on the left, they may, they may not have late gathering enhancement or may not have edema on black blood imaging, despite having pathologically proven myocarditis. So in our patients, we'll always request a cardiac MRI and say, this is an important test. And in that cardiac MRI though, if they don't have late gathering enhancement or don't have edema, we'll still, if the suspicion is high, we will ask further questions. Now, why might they not have late gathering enhancement? Well, they might not have late gathering enhancements because of time. And so what's shown here is the presence of late gathering enhancement over time in patients with myocarditis. And it looks like the longer you wait, the more likely they are to get to see late gathering enhancement. So if you wait for more than four or five days, you're more likely to see late gathering enhancement. But you can't wait that long because these patients are sometimes sick. And so the field of MRI has moved on a little bit beyond looking just alone at late gathering enhancement to doing what we call parametric mapping. And parametric mapping is where you have these quantitative measures of the tissue and the tissue characterization on MRI. And principally it's T1 and T2 mapping. And you can perform, a, you can quantitate these things in a, using standardized software. And some case reports came out on the value of this. So we decided to study this in a more rigorous way. And so we looked at about 100 patients who had these quantitative MRI techniques. And the good news is that these quantitative MRI techniques, T1 and T2 mapping work. So if you have a patient with suspected myocarditis, you should ask your imaging colleagues for an MRI. You should say, of course we need late gathering enhancement. Of course we need black blood imaging, but we also need T1 and T2 mapping. And so those T, somebody with myocarditis will have at least one of those criteria, which will help you make the diagnosis. And also the values of these criteria is helpful from a prognostic perspective. So the more T1 is affected, the worse the patient will do. So it might also help you guide therapy. A question I often get asked is, what's the role of PET imaging? Uh, the, um, and so, as you know, there's the FDA approved tracer for cardiac PET imaging, or for or the FDA approved tracer is FDG, FDG PET. And so groups have studied the value of FDG PET, and there's absolutely no value in asking for an FDG PET study in patients with a concern for myocarditis. It is not different between patients who have myocarditis versus, do not, versus those who do not. So no value to FDG PET. There are other tracers out there which may be of value, but not. these are all, the following two tracers are all research ideas and with limited data. So one of these is a thing called fibroblast activated protein, which is upregulated in, fibr in, in fibrosis. So small studies, a couple of patients suggest there's value there. The other PET study is looking at a somatostatin receptor-based PET tracer, which measures inflammation. And you can see here on the heart of this patient with myocarditis, a bright red area suggests that there's a lot of uptake of this tracer and this patient had myocarditis. So there may be value. But again, that's a re this is a research tool, so it needs to be developed further. The gold standard is biopsy and pathologically, it's very similar to transplant rejection. Sometimes we'll also go to biopsy because it helps us guide what to do with the patient because this nice study published very recently where they looked at the biopsies of a large sample size of patients with checkpoint inhibitor myocarditis and those with lower grades of inflammation actually did better. And those with lower grades of inflammation, they could re-challenge them with immunotherapy. And so until then we have this proposed approach. So if you get a patient where you're worried about myocarditis from this immune therapy, you'll ask them to do an electrocardiogram, an EKG, troponin, natriuretic peptides, and an echocardiogram. The echo should include global longitudinal strain. 
then you'll ask them to do a cardiac MRI. And on the MRI, you look for late gadolinium enhancement, T1 mapping, T2 weighting, T2 mapping, cine images, calculate the extracellular volume. And that should get you to your diagnosis. If there's still a suspicion after all, after those tests, then you should ask for a biopsy. And to make it a little bit more simple to make a diagnosis, the International Cardio-Oncology Society have published these criteria for the diagnosis of myocarditis. And they're very straightforward. And essentially, if you have a biopsy which says myocarditis, you're done. But if you don't have a biopsy, but the patient has a high troponin and has a positive MRI or has a decline in cardiac function, then that will get you to the diagnosis. Once you make the diagnosis, then what do you do to treat the patients? And there's two things you think about. One is non-pharmacological treatment and the other is pharmacological treatment. So I'm gonna talk about non-pharmacological treatment first. And everybody should be admitted to the coronary care unit uh, the, uh, who has this as a diagnosis. Immunotherapy should be held and we should talk to their oncologist about what the next best steps are. And then for treatment, for pharmacological treatment, we always use corticosteroids. They are the first line in treatment. The dose varies a little bit depending on different guidelines, but in general, corticosteroids are the first line in treatment. And usually it's very high doses of corticosteroids. If the corticosteroids don't work, then we escalate to other therapies, including salicept, IVIG, ATG, abatacept, alemtuzumab. I'm going to talk a little bit about abatacept for treatment of uh, immune checkpoint delivered myocarditis because it's a, a drug that not many of us would know by heart. Uh, the, so abatacept has, has been FDA approved for uh, the um, immune checkpoint inhibitor myocarditis, uh, FDA approved for rheumatoid arthritis, apologies, uh, the, um, for many years now. And so there's a real large world experience with using a abatacept for rheumatoid arthritis. And also it's approved for transplant rejection. So it's approved for two different indications, arthritis and transplant rejection. And this group published a very interesting case report saying that there might be value to a abatacept in patients with ICI myocarditis. Abatacept is a very interesting molecule in that it it binds to CD80 and CD86 on the APC or antigen presenting cell. So stops the antigen presenting cell uh, from joining on with the T cells and propagating the immune response. So it interrupts the immune response, acts as an immune suppressant. This is a patient we took care of, uh, the, um, where I helped a colleague take care of, who, come, who had melanoma, comes in after immune checkpoint inhibitor, feeling unwell with a new right bundle branch block on EKG or ECG. His troponin was elevated and they made a diagnosis of myocarditis. After the diagnosis of myocard uh, myocarditis, uh, even after starting steroids and cell step, the patient continued to get worse and so got into the in intensive care unit because of complete heart block, ventricular tachycardia and cardiogenic shock. The blue here shows the troponin and it continues to rise. And this patient got a single dose of abatacept, 10 milligrams per kilogram. And you can see this response here, whereby the troponin decreases and the patient got much better. There's also this beautiful mouse study, this animal model of ICI myocarditis, where animals who got abatacept, who had an immune checkpoint myocarditis, did much better. So there's this study, which hopefully will be starting soon, where patients will be randomized to um, a, a corticosteroids plus abatacept or corticosteroids plus usual care, and where we'll see if abatacept is associated with reduction in major adverse cardiac events. Now, for the slides up to now, I've spoken about one of the feared acute toxicities related to immune checkpoint inhibitors. Now I'm going to switch to a chronic toxicity which you are likely to see more of from these immune checkpoint inhibitors. And again, I'm gonna go back to a consult because I see a reasonable number of patients. And in that consult is as follows. So I saw a 70 odd year old man who his daughter asked me to see because he had a lot of risk factors for cardiovascular disease, had occasional chest discomfort, which wasn't typical of angina, 
and uh, the, um, but was about to start one of these immune therapies. And so his daughter asked me to see him and I saw him and I did a cardiac CT and the images from the cardiac CT, these are planar images are shown on the left. And you can see the patient has lumps and bumps as you'd expect in a 70 year old man with cardiac risk factors, but he had no obstructive coronary disease. So I said to his daughter and his oncologist, you know, I think things are fine, you should go ahead. Three months later, he comes into the emergency room with chest pain, EKG changes, and a positive troponin. And he has the, this coronary angiogram. And you can see on this coronary angiogram, the patient has now developed triple vessel coronary disease. I'm not showing all the images, so you'll have to take some of it on faith. But the patient had gone from non-obstructive coronary disease to triple vessel coronary disease over a short period of time after starting this immunotherapy. And so, of course, the family were like, why did this happen? Uh, the, um, he got a clean bill of health, and now he has triple vessel coronary disease and needs coronary artery bypass grafting. Well, we know that there is the atherosclerosis is a model of immune activation, and we know that the role of inflammation and immune modulation in cardiovascular disease is well established. Immune cells are an important part of the atheroma, and an anti-inflammatory therapy targeting IL-1 beta reduces cardiovascular events. So the last point is about a study called CANTOS, which was published in the New England Journal of Medicine back a couple of years ago, which showed that targeting interleukin-1 beta reduced cardiovascular events. So what do we know about these immune checkpoints and these pathways in, the, in, in atherosclerosis? So the first part I talked about myocarditis, and now this is about atherosclerosis, which I think is another potential complication related to them. And in this study out of New York, they took the carotid plaques of patients going for carotid endarterectomy, and they said, okay, we're going to send it off and we're going to examine it for expression of one of these points called PD-1. And when they did that, what they found was that the PD-1 expression on these carotid plaques was increased in the patients who had events, who had strokes or TIAs, suggesting it's a marker of, of, athero, of um, more vulnerable plaque. And what they wrote in their summary, which I'm going to read, Considering that T cell activation aggravates atherosclerosis, treatment with PD-1 inhibitors may have unanticipated, unanticipated consequences in cancer patients with underlying cardiovascular disease. So they said back then, you know, maybe these checkpoints may aggravate atherosclerosis. And then subs also other data suggested that this may be the case, that blockade of PDL one and PD-1 may increase inflammation, and accelerate atherosclerosis. So there were animal studies that said that blockade of these essential checkpoint pathways might aggravate atherosclerosis. But up to recently, there were no clinical data, just the hypothesis. And the hypothesis was that these immune checkpoints lead to enhanced immune response, accelerated atheron, increased atherosclerosis related cardiovascular events. So what are the data to support this? Well, one of our former fellows did this work where she measured atherosclerotic plaque in the aortas of patients who are getting immune checkpoint inhibitors. And what she found was that there was accelerated atherosclerosis in the aortas of patients getting immune checkpoint inhibitor. Threefold increase in plaque progression from before starting immune therapy to after starting immune therapy. The next question she asked was that, well, are there things that modify that plaque progression? And what she actually found was that two things. One was that the use of corticosteroids was associated with a decrease in plaque progression, not back to the baseline. And also the use of statins was associated with a decrease in plaque progression, but not back to baseline. The next question she asked was, well, it looks like statins might be beneficial in this population, but there's a small percentage of patients on immune checkpoints who get muscle symptoms or myositis. There's a small percentage of patients on statins who get muscle symptoms or my myositis. Before we go recommending statins to everybody, we better make sure that statins do not make muscle symptoms worse with immune checkpoint inhibitors. And sadly, that appears to be the case 
whereby patients who are on the overlap of statins and immune therapy look like they get more skeletal myopathy and more elevation in CK levels. The next question uh, the researchers asked was, well, we know you see more plaque progression, but do you see more atherosclerosis related cardiovascular events? And what they found was a threefold increase in atherosclerosis related cardiovascular events. So an increase in myocardial infarction, the need for coronary vascularization and ischemic stroke. So now that we knew that there was an increase in atherosclerosis progression and an increase in atherosclerosis related cardiovascular events like a myocardial infarction in these patients, the questions that followed were why? And so different groups looked at FDG PET imaging in these patients, right? And they have found conflicting data. So this group said, we're gonna measure the aortic FDG PET signal in patients shown here. So this image is the aorta, the arrows are pointing out the FDG PET signal. And obviously more intense color means higher FDG PET uh, signal. And they said, in a retrospective study, they said, yes, you get more aortic FDG PET signal after getting immunotherapy. And maybe that's the reason why you get accelerated atherosclerosis because you get more inflammation. This other group at the same time did a similar study except they did it prospectively and they did not find the same thing. They did not find an increase in FTG PET signal in these patients. Uh, the, um, so there's some controversy out there that needs to be clarified, but these were both small studies. The reason why I think the latter study whereby there was no FTG PET signal might be right is because of the following. As you know, FTG PET is a macrophage marker. It's a, mac a marker of macrophage activity. And the animal studies do not show an increase in macrophage content after getting immune checkpoint inhibitors. There's a parallel findings in a small pathological study of patients who get immune checkpoint inhibitor without my, uh, and there's no increase in macrophages. What both studies do show is a marked increase in T cells and particularly CD8 positive T cells. So no macro increase in macrophage, but a marked increase in T cells. Indeed, the pathologists I spoke to said they have never seen such a marked increase in T cells after any intervention. So what I think likely happens is that it's not macrophage driven, but there's an increase in adhesional molecules in the endothelium of the aorta. And this increase in adhesion molecules may have facilitated T cell infiltration into the arterial walls. And so you get adhesion molecules, vascular dysfunction, increased adhesion and infiltration of T cells into the, into the cell wall. And that can set up the nidus which goes on to develop, where the patient goes on to develop atherosclerotic plaque or, or propagates atherosclerotic plaque, gets plaque rupture and has an event. So this is a study whereby we're going to do where we do serial cardiac CTs in these patients to measure plaque and also particularly to measure non-calcified plaque. So these are the CT images of a patient um, whereby we're going to do Non, we're going to do, we're going to measure our coronary plaque, and it's particularly we're interested in non-calcified plaque, because as you know, there's total coronary plaque, non-calcified plaque, and calcified plaque. And we're also going to look at high-risk plaque features, which include positive remodeling, uh, spotty calcium, and low hounds, low hounds reunions. So we're going to do this to better understand plaque progression with immunotherapy. And we're also going to ask about mechanisms, like why does it progress? You know, I'll talk about Cantos in the next slide, but there are nice data about PCSK9 inhibition in patients on immunotherapy, which suggests it actually might make the cancer better. There are some data about interleukin-1 and interleukin-6. And, you know, there's the colchicine story where maybe colchicine reduces inflammation and improves outcomes in patients with coronary disease. The Cantos study is a very interesting one. In Cantos, or uh, they randomized a large sample size to either canacunumab, an interleukin-1 beta receptor antagonist, or placebo. And they asked two questions. One is, does it reduce atherosclerosis-related cardiovascular events? And number two, does it make cancer? Does, uh, what does it do to incident lung cancer? 
and indeed it reduced incident lung cancer and reduced atherosclerosis related cardiovascular events. So it might be interesting in a future study to see if drugs like canacunumab can prevent progression of coronary disease in patients with on immune checkpoint inhibitor. But no matter what the cardiac toxicity is, the answer is generally the same. So there are all sorts of, if, if the cardiac toxicity is driven by immune activation and inflammation, it will likely be increased by the use of immune checkpoint inhibitors. So for example, if you ask the question about pericarditis and pericardial disease and pericardial effusions, those look like they're increased a couple of fold after starting an immune therapy. If you switch to the venous side and ask, for, ask about is DVT, are the rates of DVT and PE increased after starting immunotherapy? My sense is it probably is. What's shown in this study here is that this investigator looked at the rates of DVT and PE before starting immunotherapy here on the left-hand side and compared the rates starting afterwards. And you can see the red here, which is like an aggregate of venous thromboembolic disease goes up before, but it never quite comes back to the baseline. Okay, never quite. So it looks like there's some additive effect of immunotherapy on the risk of DVT and PE. There's this massive, massive world beyond. So there, there's three immune checkpoints which are approved for use. They target PD-1, PDL-1, and CTLA-4. There's this massive world beyond PD-1, PDL-1, and CTLA-4, which are all in various stages of development. And so, for example, if one looks at the um, PD-1, PDL-1, and the CTLA-4 are immune checkpoints which are targeting T cells. There are other immune checkpoints which target T cells, including LAG3, TIM3, TIGIF. They all have various names that I struggle to remember sometimes. And there was an interesting paper in the New England Journal recently where they combined one of these LAG3 inhibitors with a PD-1 inhibitor in patients with melanoma and showed a remarkable, remarkable improvement in cancer outcomes. So that's going to get FDA approved. It'll be the fourth immune checkpoint which gets, gets FDA approved. But the cancer companies are targeting every part of this pathway uh, to try and improve patient cancer outcomes. And this, and, and so they're targeting every part of it. And, uh, the, um, and so just to take a little bit of a step back, right, here they're targeting immune checkpoints on T cells, but they're also immune checkpoints which exist on other forms of immune cells, such as macrophages. And so macrophage checkpoint inhibition is an area in very late stage clinical development. And one of the, drug, one of the targets is this CD47. So the reason why I'm gonna talk for a slide or two about CD47 is that it's a complete shift, right? So CD47 is found on many cells in the body. It's on the cell surface of many cells of the body. And for example, common cell, red blood cells, have a lot of CD47 on it. And when red blood cells are new, right, they have, they have their expression of CD47 is very high. And as they get older, the expression decreases. And once it goes beyond, beyond, below a certain threshold, the body eats up that red blood cell. So that's a sign of aging, right? And that happens, whatever, once every 120 days or so. But the companies have recognized that CD47 to, uh, is also highly expressed on cancer cells. And so they asked the question, well, maybe we should target it on cancer cells. And when you target it on cancer cells, you show an improvement in cancer outcomes. Not FDA approved yet, but anticipated there will be. So targeting CD47, a checkpoint on macrophages, improves the outcomes, cancer outcomes. But CD47 has a critical role in lots of different parts of the body and has a critical role in atherosclerosis. So in animal models, CD47 is upregulated in atherosclerosis and inhibition of CD47 reduces atherosclerosis in animal models. Now that's very different to what the animal models tell us about the other um, PD-1 and PDL one and CTLA-4. In those, they tell us inhibition actually makes atherosclerosis work worse. But here, it looks like targeting CD47 in animal models makes atherosclerosis better. Again, animal models. 
we have no clinical data just yet. The only data we have are a single FTG PET study, whereby they measured FTG PET signal, and this was published in New England Journal, and they said that after getting this anti-CD47 therapy, that the FTG PET signal in patients actually decreased. And they showed all sorts of pictures here on the bottom where they measured the FTG PET signal. And you can see here in the patient here, this red to orange mark here in the, in the carotid was high before this CD47. And you can see that afterwards where this white arrow is, it's reduced. So wouldn't it be really interesting if targeting CD47 in these patients improved outcomes from a cancer perspective? The last couple of slides, I'm gonna talk about CAR-T. So CAR-T is a different part of the wheel where we target, the, we use the immune system to target cancer cells. And essentially what it is, is that you redirect the T cells to tumor associated antigens. You take out the T cells, you uh, grow millions of them, targeted to a, partic to a particular part of the uh, anti to particular antigen that's on tumor cells, we inject them into the patient and the cancer cells attack the, or the, the CAR T cells attack the cancer cells in patients. But in these patients, there's a lot of cardiac injury. So about 15% of patients will develop heart failure and the rates of cardiotoxicity broadly defined are up to 39%. So what typically happens is after CAR T cells, they get this thing called the cytokine release syndrome or cytokine storm that also was noted with COVID. And then a couple of days after that, about one in three patients have a, have a, have a cardiac event. Uh, the, um, so there's a high amount of cardiotoxicity as well with CAR T, a little bit less discussed today because uh, the, um, in, both in the interest of time and also while this occurs acutely, it doesn't look like there's anything chronically that happens. So what I, a question I often get when I give this talk is, why do I care about all this immune stuff? And you care because of the number of approvals. And so maybe it's not there now for certain parts of the world, but it will be there. And maybe certain parts of the world mostly use cytotoxic therapies. But as things evolve, the use of, of immune-based therapies will just increase. And these are the FDA approvals for immune therapies and how they've increased over the last couple of years, a remarkable increase. And the dark blue here is where they use combination therapy. So you can see there's a lot of combination therapy, especially from 2018 onwards. And I've shown this image before because there's this massive world beyond PD-1, PD-L1, CTLA-4 that the companies are targeting. And so this slide, which is almost unreadable, shows the phase one, phase two, and phase three cancer studies among, on the outside here are all the different cancer types. And in the different colors here through the center are phase one, phase two, and phase three. And where they're combining immune checkpoints with radiation treatment, with surgery, adjuvant, neoadjuvant, with targeted therapy, with traditional cytotoxics. So a last slide or two, uh, the, um, the number of patients surviving with cancer and the complexity of cancer therapies has increased. Our understanding of cardiovascular disease in cancer patients needs to improve. And immunotherapy has revolutionized cancer treatment. The use of immune checkpoint inhibitors is rapidly increasing. Up to one third of US cancer patients may be eligible for an immune checkpoint inhibitor. So it's become what's down on the bottom here, one of the pillars of cancer care alongside surgery, radiation therapy, cytotoxics, and targeted therapy. So I am really honored to get this invitation and, uh, I, uh, and, and thank you very much. And I would very much welcome any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nilan, for your excellent presentation. Uh, we are going to pass to a Q&A session. Uh, I have the first question. Uh, we have seen a beautiful lecture on ICI toxicity. However, I cannot miss the opportunity to ask you about GLS. Let's talk about the SACAR trial. You know, the trial didn't meet the, its primary endpoint and there wasn't even a trend. Later, the, the ACC expert analysis of SUCCORD trial saved, despite its inaccuracies and limitations, 
LBEF continues to be the simplest and most practical approach to quantify LB systolic function during cardiotoxicity monitoring. I'd like to hear your thoughts and how could you apply these findings of the study in your daily clinical practice? Yeah, it's a great question. It's like very topical. I'm going to take a step back and answer that question, uh, Dr. Helves, and uh, the um, and I'm going to put it like this. There is a very nice study in JAMA Cardiology where they took women with breast cancer and what they said, we are going to follow these patients, these women with breast cancer, and we're going to define cardiac toxicity as a reduction in ejection fraction based on cardiac MRI. Okay, and we're going to do all these early measures to say we're going to measure GLS, measure, and uh, we're going to we're going to measure GLS and global radial strain, but GLS and global radial strain on echocardiography early. And we're going to ask the question whether the reduction in global longitudinal strain predicts the late reduction in ejection fraction, right? I know that's not what Succor did, but if you take a step back and ask that simple question, uh, the, um, does the reduction in global longitudinal strain early after getting these cancer therapies predict the late decline in ejection fraction? And the answer is yes, right? So about a third of women going through breast cancer treatment will get a decline in ejection fraction on MRI. And the reduction in GLS will predict that decline, right? If you stand back and stop there, right, you then have a marker which is associated with, uh, with, with things you would like to avoid. So the first question you can ask is, the reduction in global longitudinal strain predicts late, the late decline in ejection fraction. The next question to ask is, well, okay, so what should we do with that reduction in global longitudinal strain? And that's where Sucor came in, where Sucor said, okay, now that we found a decline in, in, in GLS, how about we test whether we start treatment with beta blocker and ACE inhibitors to prevent the EF decline? And that's where it failed. But I think if you take a, take a step back and say, well, the first question I want to ask is whether the reduction in global longitudinal strain is prognostic. The reduction in global longitudinal strain is prognostic. And so at least then you've identified a cohort of patients where the cardiologist needs to take care of them and needs to, and needs to be very vigilant. What you do with that information is what we don't know yet. Right. But what we do know is that there is value to measurement in global longitudinal strain. We just don't know what to do with that with that measure. Um, OK, Dr. Nilan, I have two questions about mapping. Uh, one is about the immune checkpoints inhibitor myocarditis. Many publications have shown T1 mapping compared to T2 mapping has higher sensitivity and it's a better prognostic marker. Why do you think this happens? As we are talking about an inflammatory disease, shouldn't they both be good prognostic markers? Oh, Dr. Jaime, that's a, such a good question. That's such a good question. And, uh, the, um, and the, I think one of the challenges, uh, Dr. Jaime, are, are the following, is that uh, the, um, the studies, and I know them fairly well, uh, which looked at that, uh, the, the trouble was a lot of the patients got corticosteroids before they measured T2. Mm -hmm. And so corticosteroids suppress the inflammation, right? So if they're doing their job and then you go to measure T2, which might be very sensitive to inflammation, then the T2 mightn't be, mightn't be as good because you've suppressed the inflammation already. And so they've all been confounded by the fact that a lot of those patients got early corticosteroids. So I think you might have a different answer if you said, okay, I want to measure T1 and T2 in people who are not yet treated, right? You might have a different answer. And, uh, the, um, and so I wouldn't put down T2 mapping just yet. I would say that the studies where they did that, uh, the, um, were hampered by the fact that a lot of those patients got steroids. Okay, thank you. And then uh, CMR have shown its great advantage when talking about tissue characterization. 
Why is it that T2, T1, and ECB mapping has not been yet included in the current guidelines for, for cardiotoxicity screen screening as a GLS trainees? Yeah, I mean, a lot of it is, is availability, right? In that, you know, at centers of excellence like yours, it's, you know, there may be a different availability to non centers of excellence. And, uh, the, um, and that's, you know, so to take you a step back, as an inpatient at Massachusetts General Hospital, the great Massachusetts General Hospital, you cannot get T1, T2 mapping, and ECV. As a, you can get as an outpatient, but they won't do it as an inpatient. Right, the, okay, um, I understand. So, like, it's just not widely available in some institutions as an inpatient. Uh, the, um, and I think that's one of the barriers is that you don't want to propose like interesting and likely helpful tests uh, the, if they're not widely available. Okay, thank you. I have one question from Hector. Uh, after troponin, BMP, TT with a strain, and potential CMR with parametric mapping, how often are you doing biopsies in this patient? Well, if they're positive, right? So if the MRI says myocarditis, we don't biopsy. If the MRI says we don't have any evidence of, bio of myocarditis, but the troponin is still high, or the ejection fraction is low, or the GLS is low, we will biopsy. So when, there's, when there are data that we can't, uh, the um, uh, when there are data that we can't connect, right? Uh, the, um, so when there are discordant data, we will biopsy. So if we still think, gee, I'm worried about this patient having myocarditis, and if the MRI is normal, we will still biopsy. But if the MRI tells us there's myocarditis, then we don't need to go any further. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Medina asks, do you see a strain by ECMR more reproducible than by TT in these patients? Oh, I'm not even going to try. I'm not going to answer that patient uh, that question because it's going to get me in a, a world of trouble. And uh, the um, and so what I'm going to say is that strain by there are a lot of great data on the value of strain by MRI and on its prognostic effect in multiple different populations. But it's, you know, it is a research mostly tool as of right now. And so it is not a clinical tool that's certainly in the US that's widely available, that's available. And so I'm going to avoid that question about whether strain is better on the MRI versus strain is better on the echocardiogram. I would say if you have a, if you have, like you have, where you have great expertise, and that you have a doctor who's an expert on one modality than the other, then that's far more important to me than one versus the other. If you have the expert, use the expert. Okay, here we are with some fellows of cardiology. If you are a first year fellow and you are interested in cardio-oncology, what would you recommend as far as training pathway? That's a great, yeah, great, great question. And so there are a couple of things, right? One is if you're interested in doing a dedicated MRI, a dedicated cardio-oncology fellowship, more and more institutions in the United States are actually now offering one to two years of dedicated cardio-oncology, where they'll combine cardio-oncology with advanced imaging. So for example, um, La, only last week, Yale announced that they had a dedicated cardio-oncology fellowship where they have, and they were looking for people to apply. So they have open positions. Uh, the, um, and I think maybe in about two or three months, the Brigham are going to announce a dedicated cardio-oncology fellowship where they'll combine cardio-oncology with imaging or uh, something like that. And so more and more institutions have dedicated fellowship training slots for one to two years in cardio-oncology, but they don't just train in cardio-oncology, they usually combine them with either MRI or echo, echocardiography. And so that's like, I think that's the future. Uh, the, um, is that where you, and you know, I know Sloan Kettering have them. I know that MD Anderson has them. I know that um, Penn has one, University of South Florida has one, Vanderbilt has one, UCSF has one. And so more and more institutions are like, same thing as they have interventional cardiology fellowships, they have cardio-oncology fellowships, but the cardio-oncology is usually some combination of 
clinical cardio-oncology, cardiac imaging, and some research. Okay, I have one last question. Almost every publication and guidelines have, have centered the attention on left ventricular systolic dysfunction. How have you found any echo or CMR marker that could help us predict right ventricular remodeling in patients receiving anthracycline? Um, yeah, so that is a, that is a, to take a step back, what, whoever asked that question knows an awful lot more than they put in that question, right? And, at the, um, and so, and so, uh, the, um, so to take everyone a step back is that whenever we look at anthracycline related cardiomyopathies and dysfunction, right? We just look at the LV, right? It's all about the LV and we've never really focused on the RV. And then there was a nice paper from a group in South America looking at RV dysfunction in the setting of anthracyclines. And I think it was a group uh, the, um, either out of Argentina or Brazil, I, I may have that wrong. And so what they said was, yes, there's RV dysfunction in these patients. And so there's two studies going on right now, which might answer that. They're looking at right ventricular mass in patients who develop a cardiomyopathy. So can you measure right ventricular mass, but the right ventricle is relatively thin. And then can you measure right ventricular strain, right ventricular strain and right ventricular T1? Uh, the, um, the challenge with T1 is that the myocardium of the RV is what, three millimeters in most people. And so that kind of resolution is tough. But there's three couple of studies ongoing, whether you can do that in the RV, measure T1, measure right ventricular mass, which you can do, and then look at strain in the RV. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Nilan. I think we are on time. Thanks for accepting our invitation. We will we hope we will be able to meet you in person in the near future. Have a nice rest of the day and thanks again. You too. Bye. Thank you very much for the very kind invite and the great questions. All right, have a nice day, everyone. Bye bye now. Thank you. Thank you. Muchas gracias a todos for su participation, su asistencia, hasta una próxima oportunidad. Buena tarde.